Amen. If you have your Bibles, open them with me to the book of John. We're continuing our series, Journey Through or Journey With John. All right. So uh, we've noted we've noted that the uh, over the last few weeks, hopefully everybody knows what the purpose of the book of John is. And now remind you again, or if you're just joining us for the first time in this series, the purpose for the book of John is found in John chapter 20, verse 31. And John there, the the uh, disciple John says, "I write these things, or but these things have been written so that you may believe." that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now the last few weeks we've been in the, in the prologue, if you will, of the book of John. We've, we've heard the disciple John laying out his arguments and, and the testimony and, and some of the witnesses that would be coming uh, forth to take the stand. Uh, but today uh, the, the, the uh, opening arguments, if you will, have come to a close. And now... We're getting ready to call our first witness to the stand. You wondered why we brought this chair up here, didn't you? So, 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 if, I, if, I, so if I get tired, you know, I can just sit down and preach. No, that's not it. But we're going to call our first witness to the stand. And our first witness we're going to find here in John chapter 1, verse 19, and that is John the Baptist. John the Baptist isn't just our first witness, but he's a very important witness. And the passage that we're going to read here takes place over two consecutive days. Actually, if you read the entire passage, it's three consecutive days. But we're going to look this morning at two consecutive days, and we're going to examine this witness, John the Baptist, or as we would know him in Hebrew, Yohanan uh, bar Zechariah, or perhaps Johanan the, the Immerser. And uh, he came doing something very interesting, and that is baptizing people. Now, John the Baptist's mother, Elizabeth, was Jesus' mother, Mary. It was her cousin. So they were cousin. And you might say, well, if you read the lineage, Mary is from the tribe of Judah, and Elizabeth is from the tribe of Levi. How can they be cousins? Well, those were from her father's lineage, but more than likely their mothers were cousins, so or were relatives or sisters perhaps. So Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, were relatives. They were cousins. And uh, Mary, again, was from the tribe of Judah. Kind of interesting, where does the king of Israel come through? tribe of Judah and John the Baptist's mother Elizabeth and his father both were from the Le tribe of Levi now what comes from the tribe of Levi the priest so we have the Judah tribe of Judah represented here we have the tribe of Levi represented here uh, and they were cousins they were relatives and uh, Zacharias John's father was a priest and his mother Elizabeth was barren in other words, she couldn't have pro she couldn't have children. She was barren, and her and and Zechariah was a priest. And we read about how his birth came about in Luke chapter one, verses eight through seventeen. I want to read that to you this morning. Now it happened while he Zechariah he was a priest was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the order of his pr priestly office. He was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense and the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering and an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing right to the right of the altar of incense so here picture the priest Zechariah in the holy place burning the uh, burning the offering of the altar of incense and all of a sudden whoosh, an angel appears now what happens in, to people in the bible when an angel appears yeah i saw some of the looks on your face yeah they get scared and it's interesting that he was standing to the right of the 
incense altar to the right always indicates a, a position of honor or a blessing or privilege. And he says this, Zacharias was troubled as he saw the angel and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. Why is that important? Because in this time, family is everything. Today, in our day and age, family means very little, does it? There's not very much, uh, it doesn't, it's not important if you have children. Here in this day and age, when the Bible was written, if you didn't have children, then you must have done something wrong. God must be upset with you. There must be some kind of sin or something. It, it was looked down upon you if you didn't have children. You were like less of a woman or less of a person uh, if you did not have children. And family was everything. And we, 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 we learn this because when you read the New Testament scriptures, you see this whole long list of lineage. Now, how many people know back more than two generations in their family? Raise your hand. So that would be your great, that would be your great grandfather, right? Okay, well, let's see. No. Your father. How many people, obviously everybody here knows their father, right? How many people here know their grandfather? How many people here know their great grandfather? How many people here know their great great grandfather? Re raise your hand. If you know your great great grandfather, you know his name. How many people here know their great 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 grandfather? Okay, the hand numbers are dwindling. It's because lineage isn't as important to us. Now, it's becoming more important, but I think it's more of a novelty. How many people here have done one of them DNA tests? The test, yeah, a few of you. Yeah, I, I, I've done that. Uh, I actually have been able to track my lineage back through my family, like, I think, 17 generations to England on my dad's side. On my mom's side, I can only get back to five, five generations to Ireland, because, and I can only go that far because I don't want to spend any money. I'm too cheap to find out how my, my family lineage, but uh, <laughs> I, I did what I could do for free, right, you know? But uh, lineage and family meant everything, and having a child was incredibly important. And here the angel says, your, your plea has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. Now when the baby's born and he's taken to be circumcised, we know what happens there. When John the Baptist is being circumcised, everybody says, you need to name him after your father. And mother, the mom says, no, we, we're going to name him John. The angel said John. They're like, yeah, we know. An angel told you to name him John. That's cute. But you should name him after your fa his father. And then all of a sudden, Zacharias, he got his voice back. He said, his name's going to be John. That's what God said to name him. So they name him John, and, and, and in verse 14 in Luke 1, it says, You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. So now, Jewish people knew what that meant when he would drink no wine or liquor. That means that he's going to take a Nazarite vow. Not only will he not drink wine or liquor, but he's not going to shave his head or his beard. Now, we know of one other famous person in the Bible who took that vow, right? His name was Samson. Little interesting tidbit about Samson. Samson's mother was also barren. We'll talk about that in just a second. But he will take this Nazarite vow, and the Holy Spirit will, be a, will, be, will fill him while he's in his mother's womb. First time in the history of any prophet that that happened that I know of and he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God it is he who has a forerunner for before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So we see here that John's birth was a miraculous birth, and John's birth was actually the seventh miraculous birth to take place in the Old Testament. Now, there were seven barren women in the Old Testament who had given birth 
in their old age when they could not have children, when they shouldn't have children, and God stepped in and, and, and they were able to have children. The first one we know is Sarah, Abraham's wife. And Sarah had Isaac. We know Isaac was a type of Christ. You know, he carried his wood for his own sacrifice. He was the sacrifice up the hill. Christ carried his cross as a sacrifice. So Isaac was like a type, if you will, of Jesus Christ. The second person who was barren was Rebekah. That was Isaac's wife. That's in Genesis 25, 21. And, and she prayed and they prayed. And guess what? They had twins. You know, uh, I thought when Tina, when, when, we were, when we decided to have children, I thought, you know, hopefully God will just give us twins and we'll, have a, we'll be one and done, you know. Because when we first got married, I didn't plan on having children. I thought maybe one. And my brother had four. And Tina and I were married. We were actually married about eight years before we even had any children. And we would go down to my brother who lives in Virginia. We'd go down to his house and they would be getting their kids ready to go, you know, somewhere, and we'd be sitting there, and we'd be waiting and waiting and waiting. And I specifically remember sitting on their couch think, thinking, why would anyone have four kids? Well, after we had one, I was thankful that God didn't give me twins. That's a lot of work. Some of you who have a baby or a toddler right now know what I'm talking about. Can I get an amen? Uh, some of you who work in the nursery, you know what I'm talking about. It's a lot of work. But Rebecca had twins. And Rachel was the third one. That was, one of, uh, that was Jacob's wife. And, and sh they had all the children that made up the 12 tribes of Israel. And then the fourth one, we, don't, we weren't given her name. It's just known as, she's mo known as Manoah's nameless wife. Maybe we should call her Miss Manona, Mrs. Manona. But that's Samson's mother. And even Samson kind of points to Christ because he was betrayed by his own people, tied up, handed over the, to the Philistines. He broke the bonds. Christ broke the bonds. He stretched out his arms and he defied died defeating the enemies of Israel and destroying false religion. See how, that's symbol, how that looks like Christ? The fifth barren woman in the, New, the Old Testament was Samuel's mother, Hannah. She had Samuel, and he was a prophet, a judge, and a priest. Christ is a prophet, a judge, and a priest. The sixth one, now this one's a little more obscure. This is the Shunammite woman or the Shunammite woman, rather. Uh, she was a prominent woman that Elijah went and stayed at her house, and she was barren, and he had her servant say, look, she's a great, this is a great family, you know, they're hosting me here. What? She doesn't have any kids. And in their old age, God miraculously intervened, and she had a son, and we, won't, we don't, weren't even told his name. But how is he even like Christ? Well, he was out in the field, and guess what? He died. He went out, and I think he was complaining about his head, if I remember right, and he fell over dead, and they carried him back, and she carried him in and laid him on Elijah's bed, and he was later raised back to life. And then we get to the seventh one. It's interesting how many there are, right? Seven. Seven. How many lampstands were on the menorah? Or how many lamps were on the menorah? Seven. How many prophecies or how many uh, statements about Jesus Christ did John the Baptist make? Seven. And John the Baptist is the seventh miraculous birth. Now you say, well, wait, about, what about Mary and Jesus? Mary wasn't barren. It's a miraculous birth, but Mary wasn't barren. And here we see the last Old Testament prophet who's filled with the Holy Spirit, not later in life, but before he's ever born. That's why we should celebrate the sanctity of human life. It starts in the womb. God recognized him as a person before he ever, before Elizabeth ever gave birth. Here, though, John is the last of the Old Testament prophets, but the seventh miraculous birth that would lift up the light of the world. And we read about his ministry beginning in Matthew 3, 1. There it says, Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Jewish people knew what this meant because back in those days when a king was traveling somewhere, he had a little excavation crew, if you will, that would go out in front of him and try to level out the road, make the path as smooth as possible so that when he left point A to go to point B, he would have a pleasant ride. Well, here he's saying, look, we're, need, we're going to, I'm here to level out the road, but the, the road that's bumpy, the road that's curvy, the road that's, that's all out of whack is the road that's in our heart. This wilderness is this, not just a piece of land, it's a place of our hearts as a nation. We're in the wilderness as a nation. We think we're right with God as a nation, but we're not. Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his, his path straight. Now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. And his food was locust and wild honey. So picture John sitting here before you today wearing a robe of camel hair, a leather belt around his waist. He's got this really huge beard, long hair. And in his beard we find uh, grasshoppers and locusts. And, and he's got pure sugar honey flowing through his veins. Can you imagine how excited of a preacher he would be to listen to? And it said, then Jerusalem was going out, all of Jer it says, in Jerusalem, it says, let me, it names the whole city, and all of Judea, all the districts around the Jordan, and they were going out and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. So he began his ministry in the wilderness, but he had no political power, no political influence. He wasn't a great military leader, and he was kind of totally detached from his culture. And from a society. And imagine when people looked at him, they thought, this guy's weird. I heard one preacher say he was hip long before hippies and hipsters. I mean, he was, he was the trending topic, you know. He was what was going on. Everybody was hearing about Johanan the Immerser. Johanan, you got to say what the, the Immerser. John the Baptist, he's out there dunking people in the water and, and, and the word of that spread, and people, it says Jerusalem came out, and all of Judea. I mean, he's gathering a crowd, and all these people are coming, but he had a very powerful message, and that powerful message is repent. You hear that word a lot used in the church. And oftentimes, when we as Christians think of that, we think that's something that the lost should do. You know, we, 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 we know that we repentance is like we're walking away from God. And in order for us to repent, what must we do? We must turn around and start walking back toward God. But repentance is, is, is a little more than that. It's like a change of mind. It's a change of heart. He told him, look, you need to repent. You thought you were on good terms with God, but you're not. Well, I, I think that can happen to us in the church today. In our lives today, we can just go along for a long time thinking we're on good terms with God, but there's something wrong. There's something going on in us. He told him what it was. He said, it's sin. Sin has you blinded. The Bible tells us, work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. It doesn't say work for it. It says work out. We gotta make sure that we're saved. But not only that, we as believers need to make sure there's no sin in our life. We need to make sure. He said, look, prepare your hearts. Get ready to make the way straight. Prepare your hearts. Be ready for what God's about to do. God's going to do something great. He's going to send the Messiah. And he's out there and he's, he's preaching this message. And many people's listening. He's saying, repent, confess your sins, and prove that you're going to to really, that this is really going to get stick by being baptized, by being immersed. Come and be baptized. See, baptism is a method of identification here for him. He's saying, look, you want to identify yourself as someone who's repenting, who's ready to, to accept the coming Messiah, then come and be baptized. And that's where we pick up today in Luke, or in John chapter 1, verse 19. The title of my message is Play Your Part. We're going to look at how John played his part. 
today. In verse 19, it says this. This is the testimony of John. So now you notice we've went from the, the, uh, the Apostle John talking about the, 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 in the prologue about how Jesus is the Word and how he's God and he's laying out this, he laid out this great deep theological argument. Now we're getting to the witness. So on our stand here today is John the Baptist. And he says there, this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He's referring to, so they're referring to these Old Testament prophecies. Elijah was supposed to come back. Uh, there's, a, there's a Testament prophecy about the prophet, a prophet coming back. He says, and he answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? So that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? This is what he said. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. And they asked him and said to him, Why then are you baptizing if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them and said, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. Now this is not Bethany that's over by Jerusalem. It's a different Bethany. I think uh, some translations call it Beth Page. The next day, Here's the second day. I told you this was a two-day occurrence. The next day, he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. That's an important line right there. He existed before me. John the Baptist was born six months before Jesus. Now, how did Jesus exist before John the Baptist? Hopefully, you've been paying attention the last few weeks. It's because he is eternal. He is the Word. He is God. John the Baptist, right here, under oath, in the witness stand, testifies that Jesus is God. He existed before me. I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven. Remember when Jesus was baptized? Jesus, John the Baptist baptized Jesus. The, 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 the Holy Spirit descended out of heaven like a dove. And God the Father from heaven spoke, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Okay, so we see there in that instance the Trinity. The Son is being baptized. The Holy Spirit comes in the, in the form of a dove, and the Father speaks from heaven. And this is how John said, I, I recognized him. He upon whom, this is what God said to me, he upon whom you see the, Holy, or the Spirit descend and remain upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word this morning, and we pray, Lord, that as we open it and as we listen to your word, may we be like those people that left Jerusalem and left Judea that went out to John. May we be allowed to hear your voice speak to our hearts. Maybe there's something in our life we need to make straight. Maybe there's something in our life that is blinding us, that's keeping us from seeing the fact that we're not right with God. May you tear down those walls today that we have built up, the lies that we have believed, and speak directly to our heart this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
There's a new song out that I like now. It's called, I'm Just a Nobody. Have you heard that one? Trying to tell about, yeah, that's right, who saved my soul. Well, you see, that's what John the Baptist was. And that's what, that's what I want to look at today is the first thing I want to look at to see how John testifies here is John's downplay. Look at what it says back there in verse 19. This is a testimony of John. When the Jews, if we look at that word, the Jews, that, that term is used 70 times in the book of John, and it's never a positive thing. When he's talking about the Jews, he's talking about the enemies of Jesus Christ. He says, when the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He said, well, let me tell you who I'm not. I am not the Christ. And then they said, well, what then? Who are you? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? Why did they send these people out to find out who he was? Because the religious elite in Jerusalem did not like any competition. They did not want any threat to the religious status quo. And they were coming out to find out who this was. Now, there was a lot in play. You know, they were under Roman rule, and if somebody starts bringing an uprising, you know, they, that, that could threaten their religious status. But you had all of these religious people in Jerusalem, these Pharisees, these Sadducees, uh, these priests, and they, they, you know, they were in their, they, they were living the cream of the crop life. They had this great religious system that seemed to be working for them, but yet it wasn't. It was a great big fraud. And here they were, and they didn't like anybody that was going to disrupt the system. So they sent out these Levites, and they asked him, who are you? He confessed, and he says, and he did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Well, then are you Elijah? Why? Because they expect Elijah to come back. And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he said, no. Then they're like, well, who are you? Look at his answer. His answer is really awesome. He says, I am a voice. You know, he could have said, well, you know, my name's John. I'm the son of a priest. You probably heard of him. His name's Zachariah. My mom, actually, she's a Levite, so I'm like a double Levite. I'm kind of a big deal. But no, he downplayed his position. He said, I'm not the Christ. I'm not, I'm not Elijah. I'm not the prophet. He didn't even say I'm a person. He said, I'm a voice. You back up the beginning of the chapter, we know that Jesus Christ is the eternal word of God. I'm just a voice. He's the word. I'm just a lamp. He's the light. I'm a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody. He downplayed, he knew his position. And he said, look, you know, I'm just a nobody but somebody is coming. And then they said, well, why do you baptize then if you're not the Christ? And it's kind of interesting. He, he minimizes the importance of his baptism. So he not only downplays his position, I'm not the Christ, I'm not no big prophet, I'm just here trying, I'm just a voice trying to get you to listen, trying to get you to repent of your sin. And then, well, then why are you baptizing if you're not the Christ? Well, you know, I'm baptizing as a form of identification with repentance. If you say you're going to repent, then prove it. You know, it's like two people are engaged. Well, you say you want to get married? Well, prove it. Let's go down to the courthouse and get a wedding ring. You know, this, this wedding ring doesn't mean that I'm married. Does you know, I could give this to, uh, and I do this sometimes to the kids when I'm talking to them about baptism. I say, here, put this on. They'll put it on. It's real big. Be, I'm like, now are you married? They're like, no. No, it's just a symbol that you're married. It's a way to identify to the world that I'm married. But he downplays the importance of his baptism, and he points to when he goes, look, uh, 
the one that the Holy Spirit rests upon in verse 33, he will baptize with the Holy Spirit. In other words, there's one coming after me that's much greater. You think this baptism, this water baptism is, is a form of identification. He's, you're going to be identified then because he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He downplayed his position. And if you look back in verse, in verse uh, uh, 22, he said, well, who are you so that we can give an answer? In other words, it's not enough just to say who you're not. We got to have something to tell them. You know, we got to have something to give the, the, the bosses back in town. He said, look, I'm nothing. I'm just a nobody. And then he goes on in verse 24. Is, now they've been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him and said to him, Why then are you baptizing? You're not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet. John answered, said, I baptize with you with water, but there's one who stands among you who you do not know. It is he who comes after me. And then look at what he says. The thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. Now, we wear shoes today. And we, we have sidewalks and we have paved roads, but back then they didn't have that. I mean, they had dusty paths perhaps, and, and the roads were dusty. Uh, you know, Romans started building roads, but most of the time in, in, in Israel, you walked most places everywhere you went unless you were some kind of nobility or something like that, or you were wealthy. Or if you were a, maybe a woman that was pregnant, you might ride on a donkey or something like that. But most people walked everywhere they went, and, or they traveled by riding a horse or and maybe a carriage. And, and so when you walked everywhere in a dusty, dirty climate, what, what got dirty? Like your feet, your sandals. And there was one position in the household that was considered the lowest position of all. And that was to be the slave that untied the shoes of the master when he came home and washed his feet. In fact, it was considered such a low position, Jews would not allow a Jewish slave to hold that position. In other words, it's the lowest of all lows in society at that time. It's the bottom of the barrel of the culture to, to just untie somebody's feet and wash off whatever, the manure, the dirt, whatever it is that's on them that they've walked through the day. And it is the bottom of the barrel. And John the Baptist says, look, I'm not even worthy to do that. I'm not worthy to do any of that. Who am I? Just a voice. I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes. So here's John sitting here and saying, look, I'm not even worthy to wash his feet. I'm nothing. I'm a nobody telling everybody that somebody's coming. Are you ready? Are you going to identify? Are you going to repent? Are you going to have a change of mind? But they kept pressing him. That brings me to the second point. And that's John's counterplay. Now look at what it says there in verse 24. It says that the they came, they'd been sent by the Pharisees, verse 25, they asked him, why are you baptizing? And verse 26, it says, uh, the next day, or down in verse 29, the next day Jesus saw him coming, so, I'm sorry, the next day John saw Jesus coming to him, and he said this, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man of a higher rank before me, for he existed before me. I did not recognize him, but so as he might be manifest to Israel, I came baptizing in, with, in water. John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descend as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, said to me this the one whom you see this is the one whom baptizes in the Holy Spirit I, I myself and look at what John says in verse 34 I myself have seen and have testified that this 
is the Son of God. So John the Baptist is on record as saying, look, okay, I see what you're doing here, sending out your, 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 your little uh, reconnaissance crew. You're trying to nail me down. You don't like the uh, threat to your religious status quo. But God's about to do something different. What was his counterplay? His counterplay was his mission. He had a simple mission, and that mission is found in verse 29, where he says this, Behold the Lamb of God. His mission was to get people to look at Jesus. Don't look at me, I'm just the voice. Look at the word. Don't look at me, I'm just the lamp. Look at the light. Don't look at me, I'm just the man. Look at the guy who created mankind, who created the world, who created everything. Look at the man who holds it all together. Don't look at me. His counterplay was to point the attention to Jesus. It wasn't about him. It was about Jesus. He said, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world you see the jews could understand this because every morning and every evening they offered sacrifices every day they probably uh or at least once a year they remembered back to the passover where they had to take a lamb and they would offer that as a sacrifice and here he says look this is your sacrifice not that we'll just cover your sins. You see, that's what the, the sacrifices in the temple have done up to this point. They just cover your sins, but this is the sacrifice that will take away your sin. Thank the Lord that Jesus came to take away our sin. You know, there's a, there's a Hebrew term that took place in the sacrifices system, and it's where... On the day of, it was used specifically on the day of atonement. They would bring a bullock, two goats, and a ram in. And they would take one of the, the priests, the high priest would, uh, would sacrifice the bull, the bullock, as a, as a sacrifice for his own personal sin. Then he would take this goat, one of the two goats, and he would sacrifice that sin, or that, that goat, for the sin of the world. And what he would do is he would lay his hand on his head. You see, something miraculous took place there. He was giving to the goat something the goat didn't deserve. You see, he symbolically was transferring his sin to the goat. And in reverse, the goat was giving something to him that he did not deserve, and that was life. The wages of sin is death. Somebody has to die for our sin. It's either Jesus Christ, we know he died for our sin. He said, look, it's the, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, or it's us. We'll have to die. But John's mission was very simple. What did he do? He pointed people to Jesus. God, in verse 33, says, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize. Who is that talking about there? God. He who sent me to baptize with water said to me upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining on him this is he who baptizes with the holy spirit in other words it was god that told john that jesus is the messiah that he is the son of god that he is the christ the anointed one and now john stands before us this morning as a witness in this great courtroom of 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 belief of faith and he's saying look if you really you really need to listen to what i'm saying i know 
that he is the Christ, that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, because God told me. And if we know that he is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, it's because God has told us. Jesus said to Peter when he said, who do you say that I am? And Peter responded. He said, well, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. My Father revealed it to you. You got people to look at Jesus. And finally, look at the very last part of that verse. Look at the verse 34. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. You see, we must identify him as dying for our sins. Jesus can't be a Savior. He can't just be the Savior. He has to be our Savior. His sacrifice will only be applied on your behalf if you by faith accept it. In Matthew eleven eleven, Jesus tells us something about John the Baptist. I think this is a fitting way to close our message. He says this, John the Baptist is the greatest ma man ever born to a woman. Now, I've won a few awards in my day. When I was a kid, I, I have a couple little trophies I've won from singing and music competitions. And, you know, I have these little pins that you got from going to, from doing solo and ensemble things in, 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 in school. And, you know, uh, it's kind of funny, you know, going to, uh, uh, we, we, at this one church I pastored, we bought a building, and in this building was all of these trophies, like, the, the that this church had gotten, I think it was for like Bible memorization or Bible quizzing, and this church was uh, the church that was there before us. At one time, time they, you know, they they had all these trophies in their closet. But of all the accolades that anybody could ever get, think of this: John the Baptist was said by God Himself to be the greatest man ever born of a woman. What made him the greatest? What made him the greatest was that he played his part. He knew what his position was, and he knew what his mission was, and he did not deviate from that. He downplayed himself, and he counterplayed any attempt to elevate himself with pointing people to Jesus. It's like, it's not about me. I'm just a voice. We're reminded of this in Matthew 23, 11 through 12. It says this, but the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. In other words, if you want to be great in the eyes of God, what must we do? We must be a servant. We're not here to be served. We're not here to work. We got to get out of our mind the idea that we're working for the Lord. No, we're serving the Lord, and it should be an honor and a privilege to do so. And we are only doing it because God has made himself known to us and through the Holy Spirit has convicted us of our sins, and we've looked at some evidence perhaps, and we've accepted by faith the sacrifice Jesus Christ made on the, on the cross for us, and there's nothing about us. Our righteousness are as filthy rags, the Bible tells us. If you want to know what filthy rags is, Google that. It's disgusting. It has some implications, some meanings that's very, that's, that's very gross. So what do we have to offer God? Nothing. And that's what we must realize before we can be born again, before we can be miraculously birthed like John the Baptist was, like those seven other Old Testament people that were leading up to John the Baptist. We go through a miraculous birth when we are born again, and it's a work of the Holy Spirit, just like uh, the Holy Spirit worked in their lives and filled John from the time he was in the womb. John played his part. He downplayed himself, and he got the people to look at Jesus. Where are we directing the attention when people give us attention, when people give us accolades? If we want to be the greatest in the kingdom, we need to be the least. 
we want to be the greatest in the kingdom, we need to be the biggest servant. We need to look at life and look at the church and look at our responsibility and our play. Our, the playbook is simple. We're servants, not even worthy to untie the shoe of the master, let alone wash his feet. He pointed people to Christ. He baptized with water. And he said, one is coming that will baptize with the Holy Spirit. The method of identification is going to change. Yes, you know, we still baptize with water. But being baptized with water is not the same as being baptized with the Holy Spirit. If you're baptized with water and there's been no change on the inside, you just come up a wet sinner. Are we playing our parts? Are we humbling ourselves as servants? Have we downplayed ourselves or are we overplaying ourselves? See, we begin thinking of that the church is somehow about us and the church has become consumers when we are here to be servants. I shared this online a while back and it, it was written by Thomas Rayner, Tom Rayner, Tom S. Rayner. Tom Rayner was the former uh, president and CEO of uh, Lifeway Christian Ministries, the stores, the, uh, all of that. Uh, and Lifeway still is around, even though the stores, are, the brick and mortar stores aren't. They're still around. They still have their research facility, and they, they still, you can still buy stuff. It's just all online. But Tom Rayner, he wrote this uh, on February 17th out of 2020. It's called Seven Differences Between Your Church and a Cafeteria. He said, I have some pretty clear memories of my first visit to a cafeteria. I was five years old, and my parents wanted our family to experience a Morrison's Cafeteria in Montgomery, Alabama. Now, there's some cafeterias around here. Uh, most of the ones I, I remember, they were more like a buffet. It was amazing. I saw untold number of dishes of meats and vegetables and salads and fruits, of course, desserts. I'd never seen anything like it. Mom and Dad had already given my brother and me strict instructions on how much we could choose. But for a small town kid who had never seen such a feast, I was amazed. The concept was basic. If you paid your money, you could choose whatever you wanted. Your preferences were paramount. It was all about you. He goes on to say, sounds like a few churches we know. Though we don't have the numbers of cafeterias we once had the lessons are instructive simply stated your church is not a cafeteria here are seven differences in a cafeteria you pay for your preferences in a church you should give abundantly and joyfully without expecting anything in return if you ever hear someone say we pay the bills in this church you know they act like the church is a cafeteria in a cafeteria the focus is on you in a church the focus should be on God first and then others you ever hear someone say, I'm not getting fed in this church? You know, they're acting like it's a cafeteria. In a cafeteria, you demand to have things your way. In a church, you should sacrifice your own needs for others. If you've ever hear someone say, I want the order of service to be like it has always been, or you know that they're acting like it's a cafeteria. In a cafeteria, the business must continue to make things more appealing and attractive for you to return. In a church, you should not expect to be entertained to get you to come back. If you ever hear someone say, I'm going to a church where the music is more exciting, you know they're acting like it's a cafeteria. In a cafeteria, if the customer does not get his or her way, the business must make every effort to address and remedy his or her complaint. In a church, we should be so busy doing for others and serving Christ that we don't have a desire to whine or complain. You ever hear someone say, people are saying, you know that they act like the church is a cafeteria. In a cafeteria, you have a full staff serving you behind the glass partitions, indulging your every desire. In a church, you should not expect the staff to do all or the most work of the ministry or service. Instead, the members are to do the work of the ministry. You ever hear someone saying, pastor, you should? You know, they act like the church is a cafeteria. I didn't write this. Don't kill the messenger. And in a cafeteria, you will likely complain to others in, in person or on social media if you're not fully satisfied. In a church, you should not have a gossiping or complaining spirit. Instead, you should be building others up. 
If you ever see someone complain about your church on social media, you know they're acting like it's a cafeteria. Cafeterias was fun, he said, as, as, as I was a kid, but Morrison went out of business. And the pieces of that cafeteria was picked up by the Piccadilly cafeterias. But in 2012, Piccadilly cafeterias declared bankruptcy. The big cafeteria chains have not fared well, and neither will churches if they keep acting like cafeterias. You see, it's not just all about us. In fact, it's not about us. We're not even worthy to untie his shoe. We got to get that in our mind, people. It has nothing to do with us. It's all for the glory of God. We are only here for the glory of God. We are only here to lift up and magnify the name of Jesus, to point other people to Jesus, to bring other people to come to know Jesus as their, as their Lord and Savior, and be like John who's saying these things are written so that you might believe. This is what our life must be about. We must downplay our life. We must downplay ourselves. Uh, I think it was C.S. Lewis that said this about self-esteem. Self-esteem isn't thinking less about yourself. It's thinking about yourself less. Sorry, not self-esteem. Humility. Humility is not thinking less about yourself. It's thinking about yourself less. Are we putting others ahead of us? Are we putting Christ ahead of our own desires? The church is not here to meet our needs. The church is here to point people to Jesus. You see, we're just a voice. That's all we are. It's what we have to offer people. Jesus Christ. He's the Lamb of God. Takes away the sins of the world. I can't fix your problems. The deacons can't fix your problems. No psychologist can fix your problems. You see, all our problems are the result of sin in our life. And the only thing that will fix that problem is if we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and he will take away that sin. He will break those chains that bind us. He will set us free. He will make us something that we can never be on our own. He'll pick up the broken pieces of our life, put us back together, and then guess what we can do? We can tell others how great he is for all that he's done in our life. We're just a voice. He's the word. We're just the lamp. He's the light. See, John asks, answers a tremendous question. John the Baptist here, who is Jesus? He is God the Son who's come to take away the sin of the world. See, there's three ways to deal with sin. This world has two. The first one is religion. In other words, I'm going to do more, try harder, be better, keep rules, keep regulations, and then at the end of my life, Hopefully my good deeds will outweigh my bad deeds and that'll be enough to get me into nirvana, eternal life, heaven, whatever you, they want to call it. It's all the same. All religions are the same. Intimate, in the end, they're man inventing ways to reach God. But that doesn't work. You see, that's what the Jews had. That's what the Jews had. And Jesus, you know what Jesus called them? hypocrites you're you're like whitewashed tombs on the inside of you're full of dead man's bones it didn't work it never works the bible says all fall short of the glory of god all have sinned and fall short of the glory of god you see one one sin being born a sinner automatically separates you from god that's why there needs to be a miraculous birth in your life Religion, the second way the world says to deal with sin is rebellion. Uh, who knows if there's a God? Let's just eat, drink, be merry for tomorrow we die. We're just going to do whatever we want to do. You know, do, live, you know, live for the moment, man. It, you know, like do whatever makes you feel good because you're going to die and it ain't going to matter. Or there's the third way. That's God's way. That's redemption. See, the term redemption is a big spiritual term. 
really mean this is what it means in sim simple terms buying something back buying something when you redeem something you buy it back Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for you to buy you back he paid the price the wages of sin is death he paid the price of death on the cross to buy you. That's how much he loves you. That's how much you mean to him. You're never going to, nobody in this world is ever going to love you like Jesus loves you. Nobody in this world's ever going to meet your needs like Jesus can meet your needs. Nobody in this world's ever going to look out for your best interest like Jesus looks out for your best interest. In fact, he said, I did not come to, s to serve or but, uh, to be served rather. He said, I came to serve. Him, Jesus himself said, I've came to serve you. I've came to give to you. I've came to give you my life as a sacrifice for your sins. I came to redeem you. Here's the question I want to close with this morning. One, are we playing our part? And two, have we been redeemed? See, the thing about the hypocrites in Jerusalem, they knew they were hypocrites. You might fool a lot of people, but you'll never fool God. God knows your heart. If he's speaking to your heart today, and you know something needs to happen, I want to encourage you this morning to leave your seat here in just a minute. Step out of your seat and come forward. I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to help you in any way I can. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to point you to Jesus the best I got you know what it's more than enough to change your life let's pray God thank you God for working here this morning and working in our hearts and maybe there's someone here this morning who says you know what I thought I was a pretty good person I've tried to play the part but I'm just religious and today I want to be redeemed today I want to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ Today, I want to put my faith and trust in what you did and stop trusting in my own accolades and my own good works and in my own personhood of who I am. And maybe we're here today and we've overplayed ourselves in the family of God and we're trying to get attention and maybe we need to change our minds about that and just Say, look, it's not about me. It's about you, Jesus. God, I stand here before you today and nothing. I'm not fit to untie your sandals. I'm just a man that you so graciously one day spoke to my heart and said you need to be born again. And I accepted the great, greatest gift I ever could put my faith and trust in you and God I pray Lord for this church and for every ministry from the top down that we will not bring attention to ourselves but that we will bring attention to the person of Jesus Christ because it's not about a religion it's not about rebellion it's about a relationship with that person Jesus Christ the son of God the lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world Thank you, Jesus, for coming and dying on my behalf. And I pray, Lord, that if there's someone here that hasn't accepted that this morning, that they would step out on faith and trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand.